This sermon is from Edgewood Baptist Church. You can find more information about us online at ebc-edmonds.org. Thanks for listening. If you haven't been here, in the last few weeks, we have been doing a series of sermons entitled, Have You Considered? The three questions we went on the streets of Edmonds and asked folks, one, does God exist? Two, if God does exist, what is God like? And third, if God exists, what does he want from us? What does he require from us? Last week, We looked at that third question, and we're gonna look at that third question again this week. I'm gonna show you the video of the answers that we received to the third question on the streets. Just a reminder, these are not necessarily the views of the church or myself personally. It's just the answer of those who we went and talked to. And we think that hearing other people's perspective is, is worthwhile, and taking the opportunity to have them consider our perspective is worthwhile. So, Without any further delay, we'll show you the video. Uh, You know, that's kind of tough. I think uh, God wants us to be fulfilled and happy in our existence and what's the best for us I already know I already know I'm good without God I'm good I'm a good person without having to be like I'm godly I'm holy I I do what the church says I give my pittance to the church I give my 90% or 10% or whatever it is you don't need to do that you just need to be good to your fellow man And that's really what Jesus was trying to say. I've got um, scripture, prayer, and stay in the fellowship. And I think we need to be much better at living in the moment and being with people than getting wrapped around whose opinion is what. You know, I would hope that that it would be to be a good person, you know, to be compassionate, uh, to be thoughtful. Um, You know, I think that that you know, in, in some of the, uh, I don't know how, what the correct terminology is, but the older stories of like, of, of Job and of, you know, that we don't always know the end result. We don't know sometimes maybe like what, what, what is planned out for us, but we just kind of, we got to believe, you know, that there's hope. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I would just hope that, that, that if there is a higher power, higher being, you know that and that's my hope for everybody as an individual as a human being just be a good person be compassionate be kind uh, and be thoughtful I think if you be open to that that yeah. God's out there to accept and want us yeah. to love him and to love each other yeah what that is I do think yeah. that light expects that we breathe light and I do think that love expects that we live love in defiant redemption of what has occurred to us well, I, I guess there are two things. Number one, I think that we are, that the universe has a consciousness and we are evolving towards God. Um, I don't really think he expects something from us. I think it's more of we have these challenges in life and it's kind of how we decide to handle them. I don't think it's really like something he expects from us. Maybe, I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence. Like of what I believe in and like what I think none of us completely knows so I think he just expects us to be the best person we can be and to be good people which is like non-judgmental and open and I don't know just caring to other people kind person So last week we talked about the fact that according to the scripture, what God wants from us is that we would repent 
Repentance is that change of mind that leads to a change of direction of life. That we would not live selfishly, but live to love God and to love others. We also looked last week that, that God would want us to trust Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. That may be new terminology for some. For some, you've heard that your whole life. But you see, a lot of what you hear in the world is about how we can build our lives so that we can gain God's acceptance. But Christianity is about God's love for us and Christ coming and meeting the requirements of the law, the requirements of God, for all who would put their faith and trust in Him. It's about God coming to us. Jesus, fully God and fully man, came to us. I want to talk a moment this morning about how we live our lives in ways that are pleasing to God according to the Scripture. And I want to I challenge us to just think a little bit about love and life transformation. Would you consider it odd if you found a child and you asked them, and if you're a child here, we could ask you, do your mom and dad love you? And they said, yes, mom and dad love me. And you were to say to them, how does that impact your life? How does knowing that your parents love you impact your life? How does it change your life? How does it change how you live? And they were to say, well, because I know that my parents not only love me, they love me no matter what. They, they love me when I'm good. They love me when I'm bad. They always love me. And because of that, I swear at my parents a lot. I dishonor them, I throw things around the house, I hit my siblings. After all, no matter what I do, nothing will change my parents' love for me. Would you say, I think you're missing the point, right? L love love is, is meant to motivate a different way of living, true? Now, would you also agree with me that there's a difference of doing something out of love and doing something in an attempt to gain love, right? There's a big difference if I, if I buy my wife flowers and she says, why did you buy these flowers for me? And I say, because I love you. There's a big difference between that and saying, because I was hoping to buy your love. I was hoping that these flowers would be enough to convince you to love me. Do you see the difference? There's a big difference between life transformation that happens because we understand the love of God and the love of God for us and the idea that we think we can earn God's love. When I was a young child. I grew up in California, and it can get hot in the summer in California, right? My parents worked hard to put an above ground pool in to cool off in. Cleared the area in the yard, put the pool in. I must have been five or six. I saw this landscaping that was going on. I saw the dirt clods that had been created. I saw the pool. I thought, fun. I began to pick up dirt clods and throw them into the pool. The more I threw, the more I enjoyed. Splash! See how far away I can throw them. Now, throwing dirt clods into the pool did not end my parents' love for me. But it also did not please them. 
You see the difference? If you're a grade schooler today, and you're here today, I, I want to tell you that Jesus makes a difference in lives. Up until the time I was eight years old, I didn't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I had no understanding that God loved me and cared for me. And I lived a pretty angry life as a little guy. And so when I was really little, I spent some time in the principal's office. So you can imagine, after Jesus got a hold of my life, I d it didn't become perfect, but it became better by the, by the love of God and grace of God. And so you can imagine that when my parents received a letter from the principal of my school in sixth grade, they were interested. And when they opened it, and the principals talked of my kindness to other students, they were pleased. Does that make sense? I'm glad to see a change of behavior in our son. By the way, they had given their lives to the Lord also. Today, my hope is that we'll start to consider the question, how should we live our lives to please God? Right? Ephesians 5.1 tells us that we should be imitators of God as dearly loved children. That the love of God should produce a change in how we live. One of the prayers I love to pray for myself, for, thy, for those I love, is found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. And he says this, And so, and so from the day we heard... We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This, by the way, is a great prayer, if you're a parent here, to take home and pray over your children. To, to pray for yourself, to pray for your spouse, to pray for your co-workers, to, to pray that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10 then says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Did you see that? It's a done deed if you give Jesus your life. He becomes your Lord and Savior. He delivers you from darkness to life. And then we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to strive to live differently. Amen? We have been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Do you see what I'm trying to get at here is, as Christians, it is right to seek to please God in how we live our lives. First Thessalonians 4, 1 through 7 says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Did you catch that? We've been saved, we're being saved. This, this life, there's improvement, right? We talked last week about how God wants to perfect and complete us, right? But in this life, there's, there's a process. It goes on. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. In other words, your, your purification, you're being made holy. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. 
that no one transgresses and wrongs his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. So, so just like it would seem crazy for a little kid to say, I know my parents love me so much, that's why I misbehave so much. It'd be absurd for Christians to not care about how they live their lives. Does that make sense? And by the way, I hear a lot of people say that God would want us not to be judgmental. You know, I think he does want us to make judgments. Judgments on behavior. This be behavior is a good behavior. This behavior is a bad behavior. What he doesn't want us to be is self-righteous jerks. Right? What he doesn't want us to be is people who hold grudges. He wants us to understand that we all need forgiveness. Amen? Hebrews 12, 1 through 6, I, I love this. This comes right after the 11th chapter of Hebrews, which is the faith chapter, telling the story of men and women that, by God's grace, put their faith in God, and it made a difference in their lives. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder of and perfecter of our faith. Did you catch that? There's been days, I don't know about you, there's been days in my life where I was struggling with doubt. How about you? And this verse I've clinged to, that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. We look to Jesus, not to our faith. Right? We put our faith in Jesus, not our faith in our faith. Amen? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son... Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And I do believe in context he's talking about sons and daughters. Right? Wayne Grudem in an article entitled Pleasing God by Obedience, which is found in the book, The Fame of God's Name, said this, although all of our obedience is still imperfect and our hearts are never completely pure, we can never demand that God grant us any measure of blessing. Nevertheless, after we have been justified as, entirely, as an entirely free gift of God's grace, these verses indicate a pattern in which God does bestow additional blessings in the life, in this life, on those who obey Him, and withholds blessings and brings discipline upon those who disobey Him. Why do we not hear this taught more often in evangelical churches? Do you understand the difference? When you come to Christ, you don't have to fear hell. You don't have to fear not being loved by God, but we should be concerned about displeasing God. Amen? He goes on to write, Therefore, when we teach believers that their obedience to God will please Him and will bring more of His favor and blessing in their lives, we also must make clear that the life of Christ, the example of Paul and the other apostles, the teaching of the New Testament and the entire history of the church show that God's blessing in this life is not a guarantee that we will have a life of ease or prosperity or perfect health or be able to avoid suffering and hardship. But it is a guarantee that God will be with us and strengthen us and make his presence known to us even in times of great difficulty. In fact, 
It will often be at such times that our awareness of God's favor and his wonderful presence will be the strongest. Have you found that in your life sometimes? That in the times of greatest struggle and difficulty, you become more aware of the presence and the goodness of God. Well, if you'd like to take notes on the outline, we're to point one. Every, I'm sorry, let me restate that. Even Christians can do things that displease God. Two? Second, God wants us to live in ways that please Him. God wants us to find our, our, our pleasure in Him by doing the right things. It's not only about what we do, but what we want to do. And God wants us to do the right things. He wants us to want to do the right things. Galatians 5, 16 through 21 says this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, so do you see this list of corruptions of the flesh? I know there's lots of people who think it's really popular and kind of fun to say, I don't need to be born again. I was born right the first time. But I, but I think that if we're really honest with ourselves, we know that there are things we think, there are things we do that just aren't right. Right? We inherit a sinful nature. I don't know why people argue so much about that. As Chesterton said, all, all you need to prove that is, is one toy and two children. Right? But the corruption of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, enmity, sorcery, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, strife, jealousy, orgies, and things like these. We had a conference uh, a few years back about bringing holiness home, about living out our Christian faith at home. And from this passage of Scripture, we compiled some questions to reflect upon, to consider. Here they are. One, is there sexual immorality in your life or home? I mean, be honest. And do you believe the Holy Spirit can set you free? Is there impurity in your life or home? Are you genuine? Are you two-faced faker? Do you have issues with sensuality in your life? Do you see the pursuit of physical pleasure? And do you pursue it at the expense of holiness in your life and home? What do you really worship with your time, with your money? Is there anything in your life or home that encourages demonic activity? Anonymity is defined as the state of feeling or being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. What's it like in your home? Is there hostility? Strife is defined as angry or bitter disappointment over fundamental issues, conflict. Is strife a problem in your life? Jealousy dishonors God and destroys joy. Is there resentment of someone else's success? Is jealousy a problem in your life? When other people succeed around you, do you feel bad about yourself? Is your joy tied to being better than other people in your own eyes? Is your home an angry place? Is your life filled with anger? Do people avoid you because of anger? Is anger having a negative impact on your life? Is your home filled with rivalries? I know as a parent that 
What I really rejoice in is when my children rejoice in the accomplishment of their siblings. Right? As a parent, we've, we've had those moments where, where we're not experiencing jealousy at all. Our, our child accomplishes something and we feel the joy as if it was our own. Th that's what God wants for us, that we love each other in such a way that when we see other people succeed, we're not seeing them as rivals. We, we, we rejoice in that. 11, are there unneeded disagreements that lead to discord in your life? 12, are you a team player? Or is your life filled with divisiveness and division? Envy is a feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions or qualities. Is envy a problem in your life? And I was thinking about this one year, I'll try to make this quick, but I was thinking about this one time when I was sitting on a plane and the person next to me was sharing what a great deal they got on their airline ticket. And I paid hundreds of dollars more than they paid. And I was thinking about the sin of envy, which we can also oftentimes domesticate, right? And I was thinking, in the flesh, apart from the grace of God, my response isn't, praise the Lord. I'm really glad that you were able to save that money. I rejoice with you. In the flesh, it's sulking. Now, now let me ask you something. How much of our joy is robbed by envy and jealousy? Right? I was talking to some pastors and I was telling them that one of the things that I fought in my life and continue to fight is envy and jealousy. I try to make it a point to get with the other pastors in town and truly rejoice in what God's doing in their life. Amen? I thought this morning as I got ready to preach, I said, I, I want to pray that lives are impacted by the gospel, but not just at Edgewood, at the other churches in Edmonds and Lindwin, and really around the world. Amen? Question 14, is drug abuse or alcohol an issue in your life? We talked last week at Kyle Eidelman, and he talked about like the alarm clock goes off, and you have a choice. You can turn it off and go back to sleep, you can hit snooze and procrastinate, right? Or you can get up. For some people, drugs and alcohol are an issue. It's time to get up and take action, right? Do you have a wild life that leads to indulging in destructive desires and practices? Do you have an addiction to pornography? Are there other areas in your life that need corrected or changed? And let's focus on question 17. Do you believe the Holy Spirit can set you free and fill you with the fruit of the Spirit? That, that's it, because you have to know that change is not only necessary, but it's possible. That's why coming to church should be energizing, not discouraging. If all we tell you is you're screwing up, you probably could have figured that out before you came in, that there's areas in your life that you're screwing up and there's areas you're doing pretty good in. True? But here's the thing. We can take an honest look at ourselves and understand this next point. Point three, God provides forgiveness and restoration through faith in Christ. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I, I encourage you to write whatever word you need to write there for sins. Addiction to pornography, sexual immorality, sorcery, hitting your brother or sister. I don't know what it is, but you can find forgiveness and transformation in Jesus. Amen? I had a gal this week that called me, and I, and I was able to lead her to Christ over the phone. And praise the Lord. That was a result of prayer. But she felt that she had done something so bad that God could not forgive her. And I said, that's a lie of Satan. And before she hung up the phone, she said, thank you. You saved my life today. I didn't save her life. The gospel of Jesus Christ saved her life. Amen? Last point today. God provides us with the Holy Spirit so we can live God-pleasing lives. Galatians 5, 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
self-control. Against such things there is no law. Did you get that? No matter who's the president or who's in Congress or your political views, that does not give us an excuse to be jerks. Right? We must pray for the Spirit to fill us so that we reflect the fruit of the Spirit even in how, in how we talk on Facebook. Verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So I have a slight error on the next slide because it says fruits of the Spirit, and the Scripture just says fruit of the Spirit, singular. But here they are, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In my life at times, I've, I've looked at those characteristics of the fruit of, spirit, of the Spirit. And it's really killed a lot of my self-righteousness. Where I thought, well, I was doctrinally right about that point. Well, you're being a jerk, Kevin. You're not being patient, you're not being joyful, you're not being loving. Yeah, but I'm right. No. You ever get there? Did you know that you can hide sin behind a, a spiritual vocabulary? Right? So we need to pray for the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to leave this positive because we can live positive, productive lives filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with purpose and power. And I want to say to you today, if you're a Christian, I'm going to say something in just a moment. If you're not a Christian, in other words, I don't understand but I want to understand, let me make it real simple to you. God created us with a, with a purpose. We sinned, and I've been separated from God by that sin. Jesus, being fully God and fully man, died to pay for the sins who, for all of those who by grace have put their faith in Jesus Christ. You can be set free. Amen? So if you want to do that, I would encourage you to do that right now. Just right now, pray. It was so exciting this week on the phone where, where the lady said, can I just do that right now? Just right now. Ask Jesus to forgive your sins. Ask this Holy Spirit to fill your life. If you are a Christian, consider whether it's now time to make some examinations in your life and say, you know what? When I look at the list, I have to be honest. A lot of things I'm doing, they, they really represent the corrupted flesh, not the spirit. And we believe as Christians that we can quench the Holy Spirit. We, begin, we believe that he who began a good work in you will bring it to a day of completion, and that, that's good news. But we do believe we can quench the Holy Spirit, and we do believe there are times we need to pray for filling of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? This life is to be lived by the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you right now just to Pray that God's Spirit would fill you. Confess that thing or those things that are quenching the Spirit in your life and pray for the Holy Spirit to empower you. Will you do that now? And then would you share via your connection card what God's doing in your life so we can pray for you and encourage you? Amen? We're going to close with a couple songs and, and as we do that, they'll be passing the offering boxes and please put your connection card in there. Look at those options of next steps and check one of them. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We pray that you would fill our lives with your Holy Spirit. As, as we said last week, Lord, help us by your Spirit to be more like Jesus and less like jerks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.